Mood stabilizers are used to treat typically forms of bipolar disorder, unstable mood. People have more mood swings. There's a list of them and the generics. If you see clients taking them, they're probably being used for mood stabilization or treatment of some form of bipolar condition. Interestingly, almost all the medications on that list, with the exception of lithium, are also used for another type of disorder, seizures. They're anticonvulsants, as you see up there. They're used for seizure disorders. So why is it that medications that are used for seizures seem to have this mood stabilizing benefit for forms of bipolar disorder, where people have the depressive and manic symptoms? I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I don't know and nobody else does either. There appears to be some sort of relationship between seizure disorders and mood instability that's not particularly well understood. It's just that they have a long track record of helping with unstable mood and in some cases severe impulsivity and things like that. Are they always used solely for people with a formal bipolar diagnosis? No, because you may see them used for maybe Maybe an autism to help stabilize some of the chaotic mood explosions or things like that. A word about lithium. Lithium, if you really want to be technical, isn't a drug. It's an element. Though, even though they call it lithium, it's not given to people in pure form. Any of you remember what happens if you have pure lithium in, like, remember chemistry class? It explodes in flame. It's highly reactive. That's why it's used in lithium batteries, because it's such an energetic chemical element. It's actually lithium carbonate, which is, a, which is actually a salt, which was the first treatment for bipolar disorder, it used to be called manic depressive illness, that was found to be effective. So it's still utilized. They have some lovely side effects listed here. Anticonvulsant slash mood stabilizers rarely are abused by people because these effects are not particularly fun. So they have very small abuse, you know, abuse potential. Again, I'm not going to read all these side effects. I just want you to have them for reference. It's important to take lithium with a lot of water because it can be really pretty significant stomach irritant. That's why the food thing as well can burn up your stomach pretty badly. Life-threatening allergic reaction to lamictal. One of our objectives is to help you identify those, those big side effects that we need to be vigilant about. There's a rare effect to lamictal where people will get a rash, especially around the core of their body, which of course is usually covered, so you may not see it. But if you have a client on Lamictal who's doing this kind of thing, or says they have a rash, ask about it. Because if it's associated with this, please alert a nurse or a physician immediately, because that could be a precursor to them going into what's called anaphylactic shock, which is a life-threatening allergic reaction where people can have problems with breathing and, uh, and things like that that are kind of important for staying alive. <clears throat> So watch out for any of your Lamictal users if you get this sort of thing. I've had, I've had a client once who had that, and that's exactly what happened. She had an appointment in my office, and she was kind of scratching like that. And I said, uh, and I asked her a couple of questions and double-checked that she was on Lamictal. We sent her down the hall to see our medical staff, and they intervened promptly, so it didn't lead to something. It's potentially life-threatening. It doesn't mean it will, but... We can't take the risk. Okay, so look out for that one. There's that alcohol thing, liver thing. Pancreas can sometimes be affected by these. Avoid if pregnant. Some of those are pretty straightforward. Anti-anxiety meds. Oh, boy. <laughs> Benzodiazepines. Buspirone and some of the so-called antidepressants would kind of fall under this broad category. Benzos. Here's a list of what are called benzodiazepines. These have 
a high abuse potential. They have an abuse potential because they make you feel good. You know, when you're feeling stressed out and you take a Xanax, you get pretty mellow pretty fast. And uh, so they have an abuse potential, they have a street value, and they carry some substantial risk. Our physicians and nurse practitioners really use these with quite a bit of caution. Probably the one on this list that people get the most emotional about around here is, is Xanax because it has an especially high abuse potential and withdrawal from these things can be really, really nasty. It's very rare, but it's possible that benzodiazepine withdrawal can be life-threatening. And uh, I've heard people say anecdotally that withdrawing from Xanax is worse than withdrawing from heroin. That said, some of you have grandparents who take Xanax all the time. Please don't tell them to stop, lest you throw them into a withdrawal. And if they're 83 and it helps them get by, so be it, you know. But these carry some risks. They're best for short-term use, because if you take them for any length of time, the chances of you becoming dependent on them are considerable. We'll talk more about drug interactions later, but if you mix these with alcohol or opioids, they're one of the most common pathways to drug poisoning death. Alcohol and benzos are, is really dangerous. Alcohol and opioids are really dangerous. Because all those things, alcohol, opioids, benzos, all are, would fall under the informal category of downers. <laughs> they, slow down resp they all slow down respiration. They all slow down breathing. And if you add too much of that together, your heart stops or your breathing ceases. And that's the usual cause of death with poisonings from those, those medicines or combinations of them. They ha they're, it's reasonable maybe to use them for short term. Here's your list of potential side effects. They're rather intuitive because they tend to make you drowsy and sleepy. I gave you a vocabulary word up there if you like. It's called ataxia. You see that word. It's those, it's those movement issues. Worsening of depression. Remember I said they, they tend to be kind of downers. So in, the, in a sense they may make me feel good. But in the longer, in the bigger picture, they can actually worsen depression. Alcohol, you can say the same thing about alcohol. I mean, people are drawn to alcohol when they're depressed because alcohol has basically three main functions. One, or effect. Initially, it makes you feel a bit euphoric. Then it makes you feel nothing. And then it makes you depressed, kind of in that sequence. And the first two might feel really attractive if you're depressed. I, like, I feel high. I feel numb. But then there's this depressive crash, and unfortunately, that lasts longer and is more persistent than the first two. Sleeping aids, they're also called hypnotics. Melatonin isn't really a drug, it's a hormone. It's a hormone that's naturally produced in your brain. It can be used as a reasonably safe sleeping aid. The problem, of course, is that you tend to get people who use too much too often. Um, my understanding is that if someone's using more than about four milligrams of serotonin, um, their melatonin, they may be doing themselves more harm than good. I want to be careful about that. Antipsychotics. These are the three types of antipsychotics. If you like big words, phenothiazines, butyrophenones, and what are called atypicals or novel antipsychotics. The first two groups aren't used much anymore because of the side effect profile, which I will share with you in a little bit. The two, most, the two ones that fall into that category were Thorazine and Prolixin, both available in injectable forms. Uh, hardly ever used anymore, though Thorazine really was revolutionary because it's the medication that, uh, that contributed to the downsizing of the state hospital system. I mean, back in the 50s and into the 60s, there were tens of thousands of people who spent their lives in the state hospital system. There was no mental health system like this. The mental health system in the U.S. was asylum institutions where you went away for life. 
Thorazine allowed quite a few people with schizophrenic and similar illnesses to leave hospitals. But it's got a pretty awful side effect profile, as does Prolix, and thus they're not used much anymore. Haldol is, is in that butyrophenone category. That's still used. Its side effect profile isn't quite as bad as prior to, but it's still pretty problematic. It is, it is available in an injectable form that lasts about 30 days, approximately, between doses. And it's relatively cheap. So if you had somebody who needed, who really had to have an injectable, an inexpensive injectable antipsychotic, it might be a choice if they couldn't get, because some of the newer ones cost, and the injectables are really expensive. So I could imagine it comes up, doesn't happen too often. I've heard of Tourette's syndrome, where people have these uncontrollable tics and vocal tics. Antipsychotics predominantly work by inhibiting dopamine activity. Now, again, there's not just one kind of dopamine, there's not one kind of dopamine receptor. This is sufficient for our purposes. There is definitely an association between excessive dopamine activity and psychotic symptoms. If you get drugs that flood the brain with dopamine, hallucinations and paranoid or delusional thinking can be a common effect. Some examples would be PCP, angel dust, uh, meth psychosis, methamphetamine psychosis. What all of those and others have in common is they flood the brain with dopamine. Most psychostimulants have quite a bit of a primarily affect your dopamine system. So when you drink a Starbucks venti, you are giving yourself a bit of a dopamine boost. Hopefully you don't hallucinate. But if you drink two or three of those, anything's possible. Okay. So since ele elevated dopamine activity is associated with psychotic symptoms, delusional thinking, hallucinations and such, then inhibiting dopamine activity is associated with lessening those symptoms. So all of those meds have that effect one way or another. When people say, I'm addicted to my antipsychotics, I get what they're saying, but it's not medically accurate. Because you really can't get addicted to these in the usual way we think about that. I may, be, I may depend on them to be able to live a decent life in the community, and in a sense, that's a form of dependence. I depend on this medication. Heck, if you have high blood pressure, you depend on that to keep your blood pressure under control. So we gotta be a little careful with our language. So I may, so, but I'm not necessarily, I'm not addicted to it. They have minimal abuse potential. That's not to say anybody any given person might misuse anything at any time. I'm sure you've heard anecdotes of people using these medications at parties. Like people will use anything at a party. They do not make you feel good. I really want to take a med that makes me feel, my mouth feel like a desert, and I'm sedated, and I can't walk, and I, and I feel like I can't walk smoothly. I can't poop. My head hurts. <laughs> I want this also to be a bit of empathy. In working with people with psychotic disorders who are taking antipsychotics, and they have an ambivalent relationship to those meds, there's darn good reason why they do. They may realize that they quiet, they rarely silence. They may quiet the chaotic voices I hear. They may quiet the paranoid or delusional thinking. They may soften my emotional reactions to things. They rarely eliminate that chaos. So voices, sounds, etc., usually persist for most people, and they're often accompanied by some pretty unpleasant side effects. That's why many of our clients on antipsychotics may take 
some other ancillary medications to treat the side effects. Like I might be on a stool softener. I might be on uh, clonidine, which can help reduce some of the movement issues or things like that. But so oftentimes you take multiple ones to cope with the side effects of the primary medication. Here's an, some, some more, some more cautions and things. Okay, metabolic syndrome is a word for related to changes in metabolism that typically lead to weight gain problems. You've heard of people who have, are on these who have lots of trouble with unexpected weight gain. Zyprexa is, is one that's pretty notorious for piling on the pounds. And these can all be reasons why people may choose to stop taking them. And you know, sometimes we just get kind of mad and judgmental. Why did you quit taking your medication? But we need to ask a few questions because those side effects need to be heard and ideally managed to improve medication adherence. Parkinson's disease involves a decline in your brain's production of dopamine. You've already got problems with dopamine functioning, and if you add something to the mix that blocks dopamine functioning, it can worsen Parkinson's symptoms. It can even, it can even give you, remember it said Parkinsonian-like symptoms, the tremors. That's caused by the inhibition of dopamine function contributes to this. So if you have tremors already, you got a double whammy going on, and we, we got to kind of look at that with some care. Here's some uh, side effects we need to look at there. They're again related to if there's any issues with um, kidney or uh, liver function because these are metabolized there. You know, again, some of these things repeat. Antipsychotics can, can cause some heart arrhythmias with some people who have heart disease. The prescriber just needs to be aware of the person's other medical conditions. If you become aware of a medical condition that the prescriber doesn't know about, please alert them to whatever it is, whatever it happens to be. Here's a list of the newer antipsychotics. They all work a little bit differently, but the common theme is they all do somehow inhibit dopamine activity in one type of receptor or other. Lovely, lovely side effect profile for the atypicals. It's similar to the other ones. Agranulocytosis. Here's another medical vocabulary lesson. If you see site, C-Y-T or C-Y-T-E in a word, it means cell. Leukocytes, lymphocytes. So granulocytes, it's a key cell in your um, immune function, produced through the bone marrow, I believe. Clozaril, while it is really a lifesaver for some people, I have a client I've worked with for a long time in Fort Wayne for whom it's been a real help. But there's a rare side effect with Clozaril where people who take it, their granulocyte count plunges. The A, of course, means the absence of, like amoral, the absence of moral. So agranulocytosis means a, ma a, a massive drop in your granulocyte counts. It's dangerous. It affects immune functioning. It's a, it's a bad thing, okay? That's why if you have a client on Clozaril, they need to get regular blood tests. And if you're working with this person as a therapist or as their skills coach or whatever, something you can help with is make sure they're getting their blood they're getting that done on a regular basis. After it's going to be done more frequently when it's first administered or when the dosage is adjusted. Once it's stable, those, those blood tests can be do, done less frequently, but they, it does need to be watched because that's, a, that's really serious. One of the benefits of the newer antipsychotic is they carry a lower, not zero, lower risk of a side effect that was listed on a prior slide, and that's called tardive dyskinesia. If you flip back, you'll see it. Tardive dyskinesia is a, is a serious movement disorder where people develop kind of tick-like symptoms. Some of the ones you might see are torsion of the head, like a spasmodic twisting of the head. 
uh, tongue thrusting, um, other kinds of sudden sort of tr jerky tremors, yeah, Tara, jerking of the hand. Um, unfortunately, once somebody's developed that, it can be permanent. So one of the real benefits of using the newer ones is they have carry less of a risk for that than the older ones do. Also, our medical staff routinely do a thing called AIMS testing, Abnormal Involuntary Movement Scale. It's a tool they use to assess clients on antipsychotic for any early signs of abnormal movements so they can mitigate that early on. So more side effects. <laughs> and you know what postural, postural hypotension is? You ever been lying in bed and you, you, you got to pee in the middle of the night? <laughs> so you get up suddenly and go, whoa, the room starts swimming. That's postural hypotension. Hypotension is low blood pressure. Postural is it's caused by a change in your body posture. Stand up too fast. So if you're taking antipsychotics, you're more susceptible to that. And it's not risk-free. It might mean I'm more susceptible to falls, which can cause injuries. So we want to encourage people maybe to, if they're prone to that, to get up slowly and take it step by step. NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. There's another rare side effect. I've only seen it once in all my decades working at Bowen Center, but there's the small possibility. You, it's more likely to happen in an inpatient setting, potentially. If you start somebody on an antipsychotic who doesn't have, may not have a history of being on them, that inhibition of dopamine function becomes excessive, and this individual kind of has a dopamine shutdown instead of a dopamine inhibition, and they can develop some breathing issues and heart issues. Probably 25, 30 years ago, we did experience a death on uh, inpatient due to NMS. There wasn't any negligence on anybody's part. They recognized it immediately and took her to the emergency room, but she didn't make it. So I hope it never happens again, but I'd be neglectful if I didn't mention that when somebody starts on an antipsychotic, there's this tiny risk of dopamine shutdown that can lead to death. Psychostimulants, switching gears. Oh, we went from the sort of downers to the uppers. I was kidding around earlier that many of us are, have a psychostimulant drug with us today. I had a cup of coffee this morning. Caffeine falls in the broad category of psychostimulant. So does nicotine. It's not a perfect correlation, but if it ends in I-N-E, it's probably a stimulant. <laughs> Here's a list of some of the more common ones. Now, I want you to just look at the generic names. Do you notice that a lot of the generics, generic names sound kind of the same? You see methylphenidate repeated in a few different places. Yeah, some of these have different brand names, but they're chemically very, very similar. You see that long list of brand names next to methylphenidate? All of those are the same exact chemical in slightly different forms and arrangements and cost level. So when it comes to psychostimulants, which are predominantly used for ADHD, Methylphenidate in one form or another is by far the most widely prescribed one. You'll also see various forms of amphetamine. Yes, they have an abuse potential. Uh, stimulants are pretty popular on, uh, on the street now. There is some good news about stimulant misuse. It's not nearly as dangerous as opioid or benzo misuse. When was the last time you heard about someone dying from a Ritalin overdose? You, you generally don't. I mean, I'm not encouraging. When was the last time people died from methamphetamine? It can happen. They could pop a stroke due to their blood pressure, but it's relatively rare. We've lost 60 plus thousand people in 2016, the last year we've got all the data from, due to uh, opioid deaths. It's the ones that are downers that are more dangerous because they throw, can throw you into cardiac and respiratory arrest. These jack you up, which isn't healthy, but is not as dangerous. Okay, so here's a list of some other medications that are also used to treat ADHD and conditions like that. These are not psychostimulants, but just so you have the list. 
Stratera, you probably have had some clients who've been on Stratera. Stratera is a non-stimulant dopamine booster. A or you'll hear the word agonist, the opposite of an antagonist. An ag agonist increases, an antagonist decreases. It does impact dopamine function, but it does it through a different mechanism that's too complicated to get into here. You might ask, well, why don't people use Stratera more? Because it doesn't have the same abuse potential. Because for most people, it doesn't work nearly as well. Well, Butrin tends to have a dopamine boosting activity, so it's sometimes used for this. And you may see some of these other ones used as well. Clonidine and guanfacine are actually blood pressure medications. They're actually just, they're, they're used more to help people with sleep or impulsivity. They kind of calm you down some. They're, they're beta blockers, actually. They actually can slow your heart rate a bit, which means for some people they get, feel kind of depressed when they take them because when you take a beta blocker, it kind of makes you feel slowed down because it's exactly what it does. So if you're beating on your classmates, slowing you down might be useful or help you to sleep, but it can also have some negative mood effect. Provigil, uh, you're rarely going to see somebody, a client of yours who's on it, but it's actually a medication primarily for narcolepsy, where people just fall asleep suddenly. Pro, up, vigil, a white, vigilant. It ups your vigilance. But for people who are kind of really, you know, sort of have that sort of sl slow mental tempo, you know, I can't focus, I'm kind of just kind of want to just, yeah, it might kind of make you more alert and focused. But it's not a psychostimulant. They're just, I just wanted to give you that list because if you have, if you have people, clients with ADHD and you see them on that list, there's, if they're taking some of those, there's probably a reason. Psychostimulants stimulate the brain. That's pretty straightforward. They tend to wake up the brain. They have a general effect, but they're especially potent in boosting dopamine activity. And if you increase dopamine activity, you get a few effects. You tend to get better attention and concentration. You tend to get improved self-control, you tend to get a bit more ability to experience pleasure without having to drive 90 miles an hour to do it, which people with ADHD tend to be thrill seekers because they tend to have, they tend to need more excitement to feel alive. And that feeling of excitement comes from a bit of a dopamine rush. So you get, you see how the pattern, all those sorts of things. Dopamine is especially concentrated in the frontal lobe of your brain, which mediates what are called your executive functions, if you've heard of that term. If not, I'll give you kind of the real quick synopsis. Executive. When you think of an executive, that's the person in the business who's kind of making decisions. She's the boss. She plans, she organizes, she sets priorities. Those are all things that everybody needs to do individually. I've got to make decisions. I've got to organize my life. I've got to manage my time. I've got to, you know, be strategic. Those are all things that people with ADHD, pardon my language, tend to suck at. <laughs> Planning, organization, details. Experts on ADHD think of it now less as a, a disorder of hyperactivity than a disorder of executive function. Your executive functions are seated in the front of your brain, which is predominantly mediated by dopamine. If you boost your dopamine activity, you tend to improve your executive functioning. That's how it works. When you improve your executive functioning, you get more ability to think before you act, your ability to prioritize, manage time, etc., etc., etc. So, so these things increase alertness and brain activity in general, but especially in the areas of your brain that operate predominantly on forms of dopamine. And those areas of your brain are heavily concentrated in the front, which is what mediates these executive skills. There have actually been three genes identified so far that contribute to ADHD. There are three gene variations. 
I mentioned the one, the dopamine transporter gene is, can be different. There's also one that contributes to dopamine synthesis, and there's another one that contributes to dopamine release. But people with ADHD are more likely to have variations on those genes that contribute to that, that system working less efficiently. So psychostimulants, what they do is they increase the release of dopamine into the synapse. They, um, they seem to have some reuptake effect, but mostly they increase the release. So you, you pump more dopamine into the system so you get better functioning in those areas. There are some potential side effects. You can read those for yourselves. Hallucinations are very rare and would usually be associated by, with really excessive amounts. They do have a potential for misuse, and you've got to be cautious about using them with other medications. A lot of antihistamines, allergy things, can, get, can kind of get people kind of agitated. So a lot of antihistamines have a stimulant effect, so some people can get overstimulated if they're taking certain allergy medicine with it. If you've got some kid or adult who's got allergies and ADHD and is in this state of agitation, that may be something the medical providers need to look at. The allergy meds, the asthma meds, and the ADHD meds, and how they're kind of working or not working together. Because there's been a lot of concern about misuse of these, I mean, when you look at medications that have generic names like mixed amphetamine salts, that just kind of screams abuse potential. There have been some extensive studies done about misuse of psychostimulants, and the results are very consistent. If I really have ADHD, the likelihood that I will misuse my medication is really low. It's about 15% of people who have ADHD misuse their medications or sell them or something like that. About 85% of misuse of psychostimulants is by people who don't have ADHD. <laughs> because if you actually have the condition and you take them, they make you feel normal. If you don't have the condition and you take them, they make you feel high. It doesn't tend to produce the same high in someone who really has the condition as someone who doesn't. So the abuse potential is there, but rarely with people who actually have the condition. Now the temptation for people with ha who have the condition to misuse them is because since they have a street value, if I'm a single mom living in poverty and I'm forced into a desperate situation where I have to choose between using my medication or selling it to put food on the table for my three little kids, I can empathize with that. In a situation like that, she doesn't need my judgment. She needs my help in getting food for her kids. Um, so uh, some of you are familiar with Victor Hugo's famous story, Les Miserables. Sounds a little like that, doesn't it? The guy who steals the uh, loaf of bread to feed his family and all the chaos that ensues. Um, maybe if someone had given him a loaf of bread, it, wouldn't have, it would never have been much of a story. Keep that in mind, that if, if sometimes if people are selling their medications, it may not be because they're psychopaths, it may be because they're desperate. And if we can help with the desperation, that may be something we need to be paying attention to. So there's my editorial about it. There's another, there, are couple, there are some strategies for limiting the likelihood of misusing psychostimulants. Medication choice is one of them. Certain forms of these have a higher abuse potential than others. Adderall has a higher abuse potential than Concerta because of the way it's designed. Adderall is a tablet that can be crushed and, and can be inhaled, it can be, you can't do that with a Concerta tablet. A Concerta tablet is like a rock. If you can, I wouldn't suggest you get illicitly a hold of one, but if you ha had one, you might be able to hit it with a hammer and not break it. What it the way Concerta is designed is it's actually got a laser hole drilled in one end of the capsule. And there's a, what's called an osmotic pump, which is a fancy word for at one end of the capsule, at the end of the capsule that's away from the hole, there's a layer. 
that when it gets wet, after it's consumed, when it gets wet, it slowly expands and it pushes the medication out the end of the tablet, which is why it's which is a controlled release. And the tablet is so is rigid, you just poop it out. It doesn't dissolve. So it's and and the, and what's in so it's really hard to abuse because you have to try you probably you'd have to cut it with a saw to get it out, and the stuff that's inside is this gooey gel that's kind of hard to me use mess with anyway. So that has a lower abuse potential, and some so does some of the other ones. But our docs and NPs are aware of which ones are easier and harder to misuse, so that can be considered if someone's struggling with this. Um, so, uh, Ritalin, the short act, the, the, the old short acting version is a crushable tablet, but some of the long acting ones are just tougher to misuse. So, there's ways to mitigate that risk, but be aware that it does exist. It does exist. It's not uncommon for college students to sell their concertas to their classmates during uh, finals week. Or Swap them for, I don't know, some. PS4 game they want or so forth. I don't know. <laughs> Couple of thoughts about med with kids. We've already said that medications with kids is beyond, frankly, to be is more of a crapshoot than it is with adults. Um, they don't typically always respond the same, and we got to be more ca even more cautious. You might be surprised that that with some meds, kids may need higher doses than adults because they have a more rapid metabolism and they may burn it up faster. You see that with some of the psychostimulants. So if as a parent or as a caregiver, um, a parent's concerned about the, the dosage, that's a legitimate question that we need to respond to. But don't assume that the fact that this little person has a higher dosage means the doctor's in doing malpractice. It might actually be a situation like this. Uh, Addiction-related meds. This tends to be controversial, which if I speak from the heart, is something that makes me sad. Because the controversy around the use of medications to help people addictive disorders is more politics than it is science. It's more stigma than it is solution. It's more It's more based sometimes on, on bad practice than it is on progressive thinking. It's based more on, you know, just, I think, stereotypes. One of the stereotypes is that addiction is in somehow a different class than mental health disorders or other medical disorders. But we have to think of addiction as a chronic relapsing disease, more akin to diabetes or heart disease, and treat it from a more objective medical perspective if we're ever going to put a dent in what's arguably our greatest national crisis and public health problem. We've been doing medication-assisted treatment for depression for decades. We've been doing medication-assisted treatment for schizophrenia for perhaps even longer. We've been doing medication-assisted treatment for heart disease, diabetes, and a gazillion other tr conditions for centuries. We've only started to think about, in many cases, using medication-assisted treatment for addiction within recent years. Only one in 10 established addiction services programs even offers it as an option for people. Over 90% of addiction programs don't even offer it. Why not? Well, the tradition in addiction recovery is abstinence-based. That is, the only viable solution to addiction is to completely quit using not only your chemicals of choice, but anything 
And if you look at the history of addiction in America, it doesn't work. If it worked, why is it continuing to be a problem? Here's the data. If the approach one has to addiction is the only viable outcome is abstinence from everything, roughly 5% of people achieve recovery. Recovery being defined as being completely substance-free for a long period of time. 95% of people, that doesn't work. If it were any other health condition, would we rigidly stick to an approach that doesn't, that doesn't work for about 95% of people affected by the condition? So we've got to think more broadly. That, that is not to say abstinence isn't the ideal outcome. It's the best outcome. It would be great if I could become completely chemical free. But if I have become addicted to opioids, whether they be legally prescribed or not, it, has, it changes my brain, perhaps permanently, so that in the absence of certain chemicals, I may not be able to function. So in the ideal world, abstinence would be awesome. But the reality is it works for a very, very small number of people. I came across a, a story in an article that was published in the New York Times recently. Um, it was an op-ed piece, op opinion editorial, so keep that in mind. But it did cite some interesting information. And um, it started off with a true story of a guy named Tom who had been in a medication-assisted treatment program with counseling and other support for several years. When that provider left the area and he, ha and he was no longer able to access treatment that included a medication component. For two years, he had been holding a job, taking care of his kids, enjoying his marriage, and generally functioning as a good citizen. He had to switch to another program, which was fully abstinence-based. He was dead within six months. Because he had a relapse and died of drug poisoning. One of the really sad things about his situation that you all want to know about is if someone's taking, we'll focus on opioids first of all, opioids, and they stop for a period of time, their tolerance drops. So there, there becomes a very dangerous period after that. Because let's suppose I was using X milligrams of oxycodone. That was, my, that was my behavior. And then I went into a program or something and stopped. If I resume later at the exact same dosage, what before I could tolerate could kill me now. Because that period of abstinence increases my risk because my tolerance of the drug has declined from what it was before I stopped using it. It's one of the most common scenarios in drug poisonings is, drug, is, is a drug death after a period of abstinence. Lapses slips, relapses, the language can be important, are part of the natural history of addiction. The person who manages to quit and never go back is the rare exception. Think of cigarettes as an example. How many people manage to quit smoking the first time permanently? It happens, and people can cite those, but it's really rare. So lapses, slips, relapses are the norm. So you have to, you really, without assuming they're going to happen, we still have to prepare people for the possibility to reduce risk. So the movement of the field of addiction has been to be more evidence-based, to embrace a concept called harm reduction, that is reducing risk of death, improving functioning, abstinence being the ideal goal, but still willing to work with people for whom that's not 
the solution right now or perhaps ever. And that's where medication-assisted treatment for addiction comes in. It's really not a new thing. We've been doing medication-assisted treatment for everything else forever. So why haven't we been doing medication-assisted treatment for addiction? It's only because of the tradition and the stigma and the prejudice that says it's a character problem, not a disease. Well, that doesn't make any sense. And whether whatever one's belief system may be, the outcomes of that belief system are 95% of people don't get better. Now, if you do medication-assisted treatment well, the outcomes are closer to 50% long-term recovery at two to four years out from the start of treatment. Now, there are some assumptions in that. There's an assumption the person sticks with treatment, which is where the counseling piece becomes so critical and the case management piece becomes so critical to help people stay engaged in treatment and to get their basic needs met, so maybe they don't feel tempted to sell it rather than use it, for example. So it's, that's all got to be considered. But the outcomes when you do this are 10 times better than when you don't. That's just a fact. It's not a, nobody even debates it anymore. Yet juxtaposed with that fact is that only 1 in 10 substance use providers even offer this as an option. That's got to change, and we here want to be part of the solution, which is why we're doing all these things, and we're going to do more of it. But let's talk a little bit about the medications that are used to support addiction recovery and what they do. Suboxone, it's also known as, it's a combination drug that includes buprenorphine and naloxone. What they are is they're substitute opioids. They're, they are in the, it is in the class of an opioid drug, but it's way less risky than prescription opioids like oxycodone, oxycontin, but they control the cravings and they, they, are, they allow people, help people to stay off drugs that are more dangerous and more, and potentially more, disa more disabling of their day-to-day -day functioning. People can take those medications and hold down a job and take care of their kids and all those sorts of things, which might be very difficult if they're using heroin or even some misusing various prescription medication. One of the things most of us can't quite empathize with is what cravings, withdrawal cravings are really like. It's not just kind of like, I want chocolate, folks. You feel like you're dying. You're convinced you're going to die and you get desperate to use, a, use, a, use something to prevent that experience, that desperate experience of death. And opioid withdrawal is horrible. It's one of the worst. It's not the only, by any means. It's one of the worst. Suboxone and Subutex. Subutex is more likely to be used with pregnant women because by taking the naloxone out of it, it's got a higher safety profile during pregnancy. For opioids in particular, if a mom has an opioid dependency and she's pregnant, the baby becomes dependent and when born experience, well, is likely going to experience a thing called NAS, which is neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's acute withdrawal. What a, what a nice way to enter the world. Now, if you, have a, if you have a bit of a stomach for it, and we really should. YouTube NAS and look at it. Look at what it's like. You need to know what a kid goes through in NICU when they have neonatal abstinence syndrome. It's pretty awful. But if a mom is in this program and takes Subutex during the pregnancy, the baby will have very small probability of NAS. In fact, all the moms we've had in the program who stayed with the program and delivered babies, the kid was free of NAS and had no days in, ne in neonatal intensive care. And that's incredible. Look at, look at what NAS looks like and you can see why it's important for us to embrace these women and not judge them because we're talking two lives here. Now it's very important that she stay with the program after she delivers because if she doesn't, there's, there's a high probability of getting back into 
some of the maybe the same habits and with some of the, the people who really don't have her best interests in mind. So Subutex is, is often done to reduce cravings and help with recovery from opioids. If you're male or not pregnant, Suboxone, uh, Suboxone, Subutex is the version that's more likely to be used during pregnancy. Vivitrol is another form of, uh, is, is, no, is now Trexone. It's a form of uh, another opioid substitute. Now the difference with Vivitrol is it's injected and it lasts 30, about 30 days. The advantage to that is somebody would only need to come to the clinic monthly. There's no potential for them to be tempted into selling their prescription. As I said, maybe to buy food for the family. But there's a problem with Vivitrol. It's really expensive. It runs between $1,300 and $1,600 per dose. So Medicaid will generally cover that, but private insurance is maybe a crapshoot. Um, if someone is on Recovery Works, Recovery Works only pays for up to a maximum of $3,000 lifetimes for medications. So you get a maximum of two doses. So Vivitrol is a really good medication in preventing some of the potential problems, but you can, the cost can be a barrier to people. Uh, you've heard of antabuse. We do use some of that around here. We've used that for a long time. Antabuse is, is something that somebody who's struggling with alcohol dependency might choose to use. It's a mixed bag. What it does basically is it makes you violently ill if you drink while you're taking it. So it does have this tendency to make alcohol less healing when you're puking your guts out. People don't always stick with the program <laughs> because of that. You've heard about Narcan. I hope you've all been trained on it. We've got it in all our offices. That's the uh, spray you use if you suspect somebody is having an opioid overdose. And uh, finally, let's talk about methadone. Methadone is controversial and has a fairly broad bad name. But we are choosing to op open a, a recovery center, Bowen Recovery Center, on April 1st in Fort Wayne, where we will do the full spectrum of medication-assisted treatment, including methadone. Methadone, why is it controversial? It's not because of the, med the drug. The drug's the drug's the drug. The facts about methadone are this. It's an opioid substitute. It is an opioid. You are substituting one medication for another. It's a harm reduction model. It doesn't produce the same cravings. It doesn't produce the intense withdrawal symptoms. It doesn't undermine people's day-to-day -day functioning the way the other stuff. So people can take methadone and go to work, take care of their kids, and function as, an, as, as a good citizen and keep their kids at home. In fact, I was talking to Kurt recently. One of the things we did before we even decided how we were going to open this place was we visited a bunch of other centers around the state that do this. And one of the things that struck him is how many moms and dads with baby carriages were going to the clinic, which the first reaction was to be alarmed. And the second reaction was to say, well, this clinic is helping those families stay together. Ideally, with methadone, you get weaned off of it over time. That's the expectation. In our clinic, if you're going to get it, you have to participate in other services, counseling, and other things, which a lot of places don't do. There will be a percentage of people whose opioid addiction is sufficiently severe, has changed their brain so much, that they need to be on a medication like this for life. It's not all, it's not necessarily most, but it is some. And if they stay on it, they could still be productive citizens, just like somebody needs to take insulin for life if they have diabetes. But if they go off of it, they're probably going to lapse to a place that could be life threatening. So there will be some of that, but that's not the expectation for what the norm would be. Where methadone gets a bad name is mostly not the drug, but the way a lot of methadone clinics have been run. One is most of them are for profit. They don't take patients who don't have the money to pay cash. If you're poor, if you're on Medicaid, you're out of luck. So the ones that are being opened now by the state will be not-for-profits and will be open to folks who don't have the money and are on Medicaid benefits and those sorts of stuff. The other is most, of, most methadone clinics just churn patients through it and provide no counseling, no case management support, or any of those other services. 
You just go in, you get your medication, you go out the door, and that's it. They haven't been addressing any of the quality of life issues. And be assured, we're going to do that. There are going to be requirements for participation that you involve yourself in some of these ancillary services. So, I really struggle. I, you know, I had this stereotype of the methadone clinic, basically a for-profit pill mill. And at its worst, that's what, that's what's, that's what MAT can be a for-profit pill mill. But at its best, it can be a lifesaver that keeps families together, takes care of pregnant moms, newborn babies, and uh, allows families to stay together and can speak to people's quality of life, not just living. So I guess my appeal is we all need to be ambassadors for evidence-based practice. And the evidence is if we're really going to put a dent in addiction, we're really going to put a dent in this national public health crisis around opioid deaths and addiction, abstinence-based approaches don't work. We've got to do something else, or else we're guilty of Einstein's statement about sanity and insanity. You've all heard it. Sa insanity is doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results. I'd rather put a positive spin on it, say sanity is doing something different to be an agent of hope for a better outcome. That's why we're doing this, and it wasn't without a whole lot of thought and a whole lot of soul searching and a whole lot of you know, agonizing over it, but one more death is too many, you know? And it's affected, there's probably people in this room who've lost somebody to this. A very good friend who's a primary care physician in Huntington County who lost his son. Cuts across all economic lines and all ethnic and racial groups. It's, uh, it's crazy. Crazy. So, so those are the medications that are associated with medication-assisted treatment for addiction recovery. I hope that's kind of a helpful overview of those. It's sometimes been said that any medication that is strong enough to do good is strong enough to do harm. So that's true with these. I don't mean to say that there's some sort of panacea. There are potential issues with all these medications. So here's a list of some of the more common potential side effects. As with all opioids, like we've been saying, they're downers. They tend to slow the system down. And these side effects, like reduced breathing and so on, reflect that. So if you were to see those effects in someone taking these medications, the proper response would be to alert the prescriber. And of course, if it appeared to be severe, call 911. Additionally, these are a bit more rare. So I would, again, emphasize the slowing heart rate which in excessive doses can be dangerous, if not lethal. Drowsiness, etc. You might be surprised to see the last one, sleep difficulties, but you can get a bit of a rebound effect. It's similar to what you get with alcohol. It may make you drowsy at first, but it can inhibit deep sleep longer on. So there are medications for opioids, there are medications for alcohol. There aren't any medication-assisted treatment drugs for, psycho, for stimulants and psychostimulants like meth or amphetamine. The pharmacology of that is very difficult. Thankfully, there are medications to help people through the cravings and withdrawal for the drugs that are most dangerous and place them at highest risk for death. So stay tuned. That those may evolve eventually, but they don't exist as we speak here today. All right, let's talk about food-drug interactions. There's loads of them, and there's no way we could cover all the possibilities here, but here are some of the most common drug drug, food-drug interactions. What that means, I guess it's pretty self-explanatory, is that eating a certain food or consuming a certain beverage in combination with the medication can somehow affect its action. I don't know that many people who are into grapefruit juice. But I guess there are some. And grapefruit juice is notorious for messing with a whole myriad of medications. So if you're into grapefruit juice or have a client who is, make sure you talk to the prescriber because whether it's a psychiatric medication, 
uh, medication assisted treatment for addiction medication, something else they're taking, there's a fair chance that grapefruit juice will mess with the absorption of it, so it's going to be less effective. There's a list of some of the medications that our clients may be taking that uh, can be affected by this. Of course, we spent a bunch of time just now talking about MAT and methadone, so that's on the list as well. Salt. We all know that too much of that isn't good for us anyway, but if you happen to have a form of bipolar disorder and are being treated with lithium, more accurately, lithium carbonate, too much, too high salt a diet can interfere with absorption because lithium carbonate is a type of salt, and kind of intuitively, too much of this can mess around with absorbing the other one. So uh, in a country where high salt diets are pretty commonplace, we may not want, ideally want a client on lithium for bipolar disorder to be a, you know, a potato chip addict. <laughs> Probably not ideal. Caffeine can also affect lithium. Too much caffeine will reduce absorption of that. So I have bipolar disorder and I'm taking lithium to control it and I'm drinking a lot of coffee. My medication may be less effective. So the dosage may need to be increased, which carries increased risk of side effects or renal toxicity, that's kidney toxicity. Ideally, I'd reduce my caffeine content so there's less need to make a medication adjustment. Clauseril, remember that's the one that can call, cause that agranulocytosis phenomenon we talked about. Caffeine will actually increase the absorption, so uh, it, it may elevate the likelihood of maybe some side effects or drowsiness or things like that. Uh, St. John's wort, we mentioned it earlier in response to a question, but here's a list of some of the medications that can affect. The upward arrow indicates it will tend to increase the effect, the downward arrow it tends to decrease their their effect, but it's a, it's a commonly used over-the-counter medication. It, it has some antidepressant properties, as I mentioned before. But I, I think I should add, whether it's St. John's Ward or any other herbal, it's still important that the prescriber be aware of what other supplements people are taking because, well, St. John's Ward is a, is a good example, and since it's a, used for depression specifically, it, it's appropriate for this conversation. But there's lots of other suppl supplements and herbal supplements and vitamins and stuff that can interact with drugs. There's too many to mention. Just be aware of it, and ideally, prescribers should know everything that someone's taking. Full or empty stomach. Geodon and the benzos, those are two that stand out. Geodon is one of the novel atypical antipsychotic. Supposed to take it with at least 500 calories. That's really not a whole lot. But if you take it with less than that, you get diminished benefit. It reduces absorption. There's also an, a, larger, a larger chance of some stomach upset. The benzos, the benzodiazepines, are much more rapidly absorbed on an empty stomach. Now, this is not trivial because of what we've talked about, that benzos in combination with alcohol and or opiate, opiates can be a lethal cocktail. So if I'm, in worst case scenario, have an opioid, whether it's legally prescribed or otherwise, and they're and Xanax or a benzodiazepine, and then add to it alcohol, that's a formula for tragedy. Doing it on an empty stomach just elevates the risk even higher. Any medication that's strong enough to do good can also cause problems. Why did I put that up there? We want to talk a little bit about our responsibility if people aren't getting appropriate treatment. The, uh, Stephen Paddock was the Las Vegas shooter who killed over 50 people from a third, I think roughly a 30-story uh, window in Las Vegas. That young man, his name's escaping me at the moment, was the one who uh, shot all the kids at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut a few years ago. Play this scenario out with me. You're working with a client, let's say, who has a history of violent behavior, and they stop or refuse to take medication or, or, for that matter, other treatments that they need to stay healthier and presumably safer. What's our responsibility? I might go say something like, well, he's legally an adult. <clears throat> he has a right to refuse medication or other interventions. I might say, well, let's pursue a psychiatric commitment 
because we have a person at risk who's non-compliant with needed medical medication or, and or other treatments. So let's pursue a uh, commitment. Okay, that's an option. Do you know what a commitment does? Well, it's a legal document that requires the client to participate in treatment. But can we force them to take medication if they're under commitment? What if it were Steve and Paddock? I mean, I don't know his psychiatric history, but just imagine for the sake of discussion that this is a month before the Las Vegas tragedy. He's known to his local mental health system as a client. He's been prescribed medication and other services to reduce his risk and help him get healthy. And he essentially tells us where to go. So our response is to say, he's an adult. He has a right to refuse. And, and a month later, you find out there's 50 plus bodies on the streets of Las Vegas. What's our responsibility when people refuse treatment? Well, if they're at low risk, that's a different scenario. But if they're at high risk, we have a high level of responsibility to act. We can't just sort of say, client choice, and move on to the next situation. We need to talk to supervisors and others about the possibility of pursuing a commitment. Let's suppose we get the commitment. There are a couple different kinds. A standard, regular commitment doesn't carry with it a mandate for the client to take medication. A client on commitment can't have medication, so to speak, shoved down their throat or injected into their, into their musculature. But what if they're at risk and they're on commitment and they still refuse to take needed medication and other treatments and we believe they're potentially at risk to themselves or others? Okay, we've done all we can. We tried, and a month later we have 50 plus bodies on the streets of Las Vegas. There is another option. I want everybody to know that if we got a situation where a client is at high risk for violence and they refuse medication and a regular commitment isn't enough, it is possible to go back to court for a thing called a commitment with a medication mandate. It's a higher level of commitment, which does allow the person to be forcibly medicated by injection if necessary. Now, we would never do that cavalierly. It is, in a true sense, a violation of someone's civil rights. But you could argue that the good of the many outweighs the choice of the one. I don't know about Stephen Paddock and these folks, but I do wonder if there had been some opportunity for somebody who knew these folks were mentally ill and dangerous if they'd been more responsible and intervened more aggressively, these tragedies could have been prevented. I don't know the answer to that. And like I said, I really don't know the details of the mental health history of these people. There's only limited information out there. But here's the take-home message. The client really has to have medication to be safe. There are avenues we need to pursue. You can't just stop the conversation by saying, well, there's nothing we can do. They have a right to refuse treatment. They have a right to refuse treatment only to a point. So nobody's expected to do this, pursue these sort of things, and, and uh, make these decisions unilaterally. Talk to me. Talk to your supervisors. Talk to others. But please, 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 if you're working with somebody who you think might be dangerous and medication adherence or compliance, I don't particularly like that word, but you've heard it, is an issue, be bold. Speak up. We, need to take, we may need to take necessary action so we don't have an incident like this in one of the communities we serve. So those bullet points up there reflect that. Comment about competency. Competency is a legal term. It refers to one's ability to make adequate decisions on one's own behalf. So if I, for instance, suffered from latter stage dementia, I probably wouldn't be competent to make thoughtful decisions about finances or about my health, my health care, et cetera. So someone would likely be appointed power of attorney over those things to make those decisions for me. There may be a situation where you're working with a client where because of 
dementia, mental illness, developmental disability, you don't believe they're competent to make medical decisions or medication decisions on their, own, on their behalf. And you may be in a situation where you're seeing them make really poor decisions. Same appeal. Don't just stop there. Don't be silent. Don't take that for an answer. Please bring it forth for conversation. Because we may need to do some sort of evaluation to determine if someone's competent. And then it's up to a judge to make a, determ a legal determination if someone is competent or not. And then appoint, likely appoint a guardian or somebody with some other legal status to make those medication decisions for them. Why do I even bring these things up? Because the things I'm mentioning have happened. Not a lot. But we've had incidents where we found out after the fact that something bad happened. Not a tragedy on this scale. But something bad happened because a client wasn't taking their medication. And we, had, we could have done some things, but we didn't because we just stopped at, well, he refuses. There's nothing I can do. There are things we can do. So let's, let's talk about it. What about kids? Uh, like it or not, kids basically don't have much in the way of rights prior to 18 in, this, in the, the state of Indiana. So it really boils down to guardian-parent consent when it comes to medications. But what if you have a situation of a kid who really needs a medication and may even be unsafe without it, and the parent or guardian is refusing to cooperate with professional medical advice, that may constitute child neglect, medical neglect, or child endangerment. Talk to your supervisor, because that may, that may be something that requires a report to protective services. So parents make those decisions for their kids, but that doesn't mean there isn't some recourse if they're making bad or even dangerous decisions about their, their child's care and medical care and mental health care. Non-psychiatric meds, it's the same thing. This fo we've been focusing on psychiatric meds, but that doesn't eliminate us as service providers being attentive to what clients are doing with other kinds of medications. I wasn't taking my insulin or taking it properly because, for example, I suffer from paranoid delusion, and I've come to believe that someone's putting something poisonous in my medication, so I don't want to take it. Well, it's not a, insulin's not a psychiatric medication, but, I, but we still have some responsibility to be paying attention to that, because we really need to be agents for someone's total health. So if you see things like that, where people have medical conditions, diabetes being one of the most common we see, but not the only one, and clients are taking their medication improperly or not taking it correctly or, you know, or, or refusing to take it, don't just dismiss that as kind of outside the scope of our responsibility. We need to talk about that stuff, too. Because people are all connected. My diabetic condition is going to affect my mood and perhaps my my thinking and halluc my hallucinations or delusions or whatever. So this, what I'm saying, isn't limited just to psychiatric medications. We should know all the medications our clients are taking and at least do some monitoring of those sorts of things on their behalf. And if you have questions, bring it forward to supervision. Call me or call somebody so we can take a look at people's total health.